Uh, first speaker is Professor Pyong Ha Shin. So he is an assistant professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at KAIST. And then he has worked on a wide range of uh, fields. And then his past research was about the thin film growth kinetics and high K dielectric materials for microelectronic applications. And his current research interest is developing novel materials for energy applications with the emphasis on hybrid perovskite optoelectronic devices. So to date, he uh, has published uh, more than 90 uh, journal papers and delivered more than 100 invited presentations. And also he is the recent recipient of 2019 KAIST Top 10 Research Achievement Award. So please welcome him with a big hand. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, except um, I was luckily promoted to associate professor uh, three years ago. <laughs> so good afternoon and uh, good late night uh, for the audience from the uh, other continents. So today I'll be discussing uh, our recent progress in uh, probes quite uh, affordable takes. Uh, let me first begin with uh, briefly uh, mentioning our group's uh, research effort. Uh, so we have uh, four subtopics. The first topic is uh, inorganic, uh, mostly calcogenide and uh, nitride thin film photovoltaics, such as uh, kappa indium gallium diselenide and kappa zinc tin sulfide and antimony selenide, and as well as nitride. And today's topic, the Provoskai solar cell, uh, I'm working on it. And uh, I realized that the potential of using a perovskite uh, light observer as light emitter. So therefore, uh, uh, one subgroup uh, in, uh, in my group uh, is working on the perovskite LED. And working with uh, excellent light observers uh, naturally led us to expand to photoelectrochemical energy conversion, such as uh, water splitting and uh, nitrogen reduction. So switching to the today's main topic, perovskite solar cells. So even though you're not working in the field of photovoltaics, you probably heard of this material perovskite. So why, why interest in this material? What's special about this? It is simply because high efficiency. So right now, the record efficiency of perovskite, as you can see from here, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the uh, mouse pointer here. Uh, so the current uh, record efficiency of single junction perovskite is over 25%. But about 12 years ago, uh, about 11 years ago, when the first paper on perovskite was published, the efficiency was only 3 to 4 percent. So within 10 years, the efficiency has progressed from single digit to over 20 percent, which is unprecedented. So in other technologies, it took almost 20 to 30 years to get to where the perovskite is, uh, uh, is right now. So this is why people are so much interested in this material However, perovskite is not free of any issues. So this is the list of issues that I think we need to solve before this technology gets commercialized. First, we need to better understand the transport property, fundamental transport properties of perovskite. And perovskite has lead, and it is not the most stable material. And also we need to develop a way to uh, coat this material over a large area. And then if we consider commercial, uh, commercialization of this technology, right now the market is dominated by silicon because silicon is incredibly cheap these days. So in the foreseeable future, replacing silicon with the other emerging PV technology will be very, very challenging. Then the smartest strategy would be piggybacking the existing technology that is mature and successful. So here comes uh, tandem uh, approaches. So what's written in red is uh, our group's uh, approach to address these issues. And today, uh, because of time restriction, I cannot speak of all the topics. So I'll mainly focus on the first, the understanding fundamental properties and the, the perovskite tandem. So this is the uh, collection of literature report um, uh, studying on transport properties of uh, perovskite. So I wanna mention a couple of things here. So most of techniques to study the fundamental properties of perovskite are transient techniques. So PL, transient absorption, um, uh, uh, terahertz, microwave conductivity, and et cetera. And second, none of these studies were able to fill all the info critical uh, properties such as lifetime, diffusion length, and mobility, and carrier, excess carrier concentration by illumination and the recombination coefficient. And I'm proud to say that uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, IBM, uh, 
we developed a carrier result for all technique, which allowed us to measure all of this parameter uh, under um, the steady state illumination. Because all of these previous studies using transient techniques, uh, they use um, initially very high intensity and then monitor how the signal changes when the excitation is gone. But our PV solar cells does not operate, do not operate under steady, uh, under transient condition. They um, operate under steady state illumination of modest intensity. And our technique, uh, the measurement was done uh, under such conditions. So believing that the majority of audience is student, um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about photovoltaic uh, uh, physics, uh, explaining why. Oh, sorry. So why these properties are important. So here you have P-type semiconductor under dark, and it is under thermal equilibrium. So you have Fermi level close to valence band. And now on the illumination, it generates a lot of electron hole pairs. So no longer the carrier, uh, carriers is dominated by majority carriers. So you have a lot of minority carriers. So system is no longer under thermal equilibrium. However, between electrons and between holes, the thermal relaxation is so fast, so you can almost assume thermal equilibrium. Therefore, quasi Fermi level for electron and quasi Fermi level for holes. These are the free energies of electron and free energies of holes. And the maximum useful work or maximum useful electrical work that you can extract by extracting one hole and one electron is basically the difference in free energy because the holes and electron, they have opposite charge. Then using this, uh, the base textbook equations that relates carrier concentration and the uh, Fermi level, we can see that the splitting of a quasi Fermi level, which is the maximum voltage you can get out of this material, is simply proportional, logarithmically proportional to delta N, which is uh, steady state excess carrier concentration produced by light illumination. And delta N is simply given by product of production rate. So how many photons you generate per time, per unit volume, multiplied by lifetime, how long they live. So you get delta N. So therefore, improving tau, the lifetime is very important. And there are two uh, mechanisms that determine the lifetime. The first mechanism is a radiative recombination. And second one is a non-radiative recombination. The radiative recombination, you cannot do anything. This is material's property, and this is what's dictating the Shockley quasar limit. However, what you can do is suppressing non-radiative recombination by passivating defects. Therefore, if you want to improve the voltage of your uh, solar cells, you have to make sure your light observer has to be highly luminescent. So you should, uh, so for those who work in the field of PV, if you want to develop new material for uh, solar cells, make sure you take uh, PL measurements. So a lot of cases in solar cell, the PN junction, PN heterojunction is implemented because it has advantage, uh, advantages of establishing building potential, which assist charge separation. But for those who generated away from the depletion edge, they have to diffuse. Therefore, minority carrier diffusion length is also important and if you look at this equation, the mu appears here, the uh, mobility appears here, and lifetime appears here. So therefore, mu, tau, delta n, they are, these are the critical factors that will determine the performance of your PV devices. So traditionally, people have used the whole measurement to study um, transport property of semiconductors. So in whole measurement, you measure conductivity and what's called whole coefficient. So from these two measurements, you determine majority carrier concentration and majority carrier mobility. And from the sign of whole coefficient, you determine the type of majority carrier. So if whole coefficient is negative, the majority carrier is electron. And if, if, if this uh, whole coefficient is positive, the majority carrier is a whole. However, applying the whole measurement into a uh, photovoltaic material can be very challenging because um, the photovoltaic material, they tend to be uh, more resistive than uh, the electronic uh, semiconductors used in electronic devices. So my former colleague at uh, IBM uh, Watson Research Center, 
the Oki Gunawan, who is, by the way, the, the finest electrical engineer that I ever met. So he invented uh, what's called the rotating parallel dipole line system, where he coupled, he used a pair of magnets, and by rotating master, the slave follows, and as a result, you produce purely harmonic AC magnetic field. So in conventional photo uh, hole measurement, you use um, the DC uh, magnetic field, and here, by using AC magnetic field coupled with um, locking detection, uh, he was able to improve the sensitivity a lot. So that's good. So we can do whole measurement on uh, most of uh, light observers. But yet another problem is um, for semiconductor in the dark, you measure two parameters, two variables, uh, sigma and H, and two unknowns, mobility and carrier concentration. So you all set. However, our solar cell it operates under light illumination so it is no longer one ca single carrier system because you not only have majority carriers, but now you have also a lot of minority carriers too. So electrical conductivity, there are two contributions, one from electron and one from holes. So still hole measurement, you measure two parameters, sigma and H, but now unknowns are three, mu N, mu H, and delta N. So we need one more equation. So the central part of our recent work with IBM was identification of a, a third equation that is hidden in this relation, which is shown here, which basically relate H and sigma with the difference between mobilities. So we now have three equations, three unknowns, and we can solve analytically. Solutions are here. So derivation of this equation you can find from this paper, but let me give just a quantitative explanation. So here is the example of uh, two imaginary semiconductor, two imaginary p-type semiconductor with the whole concentration of 10 to 16 and with the same whole mobility, 10. Now, one semiconductor, it has same electron, electron mobility, which is 10, but let's say the second semiconductor, it, the electron mobility is twice as large, tw uh, 20. Now, here I plot whole coefficient as a function of conductivity, and you can think of this conductivity as uh, uh, illumination intensity because highest uh, illumination, more carriers, therefore more, uh, more conducting. And on the dark, when conductivity is the lowest, the whole coefficient is going to be quite positive because the conduct carrier conduction is dominated by holes and it will be the same because for these two semiconductors. But as you illuminate uh, with the stronger intensity, you now generate more electrons, therefore the whole coefficient becomes close to zero because not only now not only you have a, a contribution from holes, but you have contribution from electrons. But the first semiconductor, mobilities are the same, but there is always more number of holes than electron by 10 to the 16. Therefore, whole coefficient can never be zero. It can it will approach zero, but it, it can never be negative. However, the second semiconductor, even though there, are, there is more number of holes, because electron is twice as fast, the contribution from electric conduction is mainly, can be mainly from electron, therefore the whole coefficient switches the sign. So therefore, this, uh, the relation between H and sigma, it will tell you the difference between uh, two mobilities as shown in this equation. So we apply these equations to our measurement. So this is the raw data, and this is after uh, uh, data processing. And for the data processing, we were able to determine whole mobility and electron mobility separately as a function of light intensity. And also we determine the delta N, the excess carrier concentration, as a function of uh, illumination that, uh, for uh, every single um, the sun intensity. So, uh, and also uh, by knowing um, the um, knowing a delta n by measuring delta n, and we know that the generation rate by knowing the absorption coefficient of your material, and we can also determine tau and uh, diffusion length here, as shown on the uh, right side of the figure here. So, a couple of things that I want to mention. So, most of semiconductor electrons are faster. But in probe kite, it's a little peculiar that holes are faster than electrons. And second, the lifetime, the carrier recombination lifetime, is dependent on the illumination level. So in literature, you, you see the, you, 
see many reports of the lifetime of perovskite, but unless you specify the measurement was done uh, at which illumination intensity, uh, it can be misleading because we've shown here that lifetime can change a few orders of magnitude by changing uh, light intensity. And another important information that you can get out of uh, this delta N versus generation rate or delta N versus uh, light intensity here is recombination kinetics. So uh, under steady state, the generation of carriers has to be balanced by recombination. And there are three uh, possible mechanisms for recombination. The first one is monomolecular mediated by traps as described by uh, Shockley uh, read the whole type of uh, traps. And the second mechanism is bimolecular recombination. So it's proportional to delta N square because you need one electron from conduction band and you need one hole from valence band. And the third mechanism, which I didn't write here because it's not dominating in a PB uh, under the conditions where PB operate is a OJ recombination, which will be proportional to delta N to the cube. So at low intensity or low delta N, the monomolecular recombination dominates so therefore, the delta N is proportional to G, the generation rate, to the power of one. And high illumination, or um, the large delta N, the, the bimolecular recombination, radiated bimolecular bimole recombination dominates. So therefore, delta N goes to G to the power of half. And our data shown here, the delta N, uh, versus G, you can see that the slope is initially one monomolecular, and then it switches to slope of half, which appears to be bimolecular recombination. So first we are very happy with uh, this text-like uh, data, but there is only uh, one problem. What you can also determine is this coefficient, recombination coefficient from the intercept. So we determine K2, bimolecular recombination coefficient from the, this uh, data here. And this is our number, about 10 to the minus eight cubic centimeter per square, which is just way too high. I mean, the recombination uh, coefficient, which determines how fast they recombine, is basically reciprocal of how fast the material observes light. So good, excellent light observer, the recombination coefficient is also very high. But even gallium arsenide, which is excellent light observer, the K2 bimolecular recombination coefficient is 10 to the minus 10, and our number is two orders of magnitude higher. So there's something wrong here. So we used uh, TLPL, uh, just like uh, other groups. So when people report K2, uh, mainly they look at the, uh, they use TRPL. So we used the TLPL, we analyzed. We also found that the same sample that we used for photo hole, the K2 was also 10 to the minus 10. Then what causes this difference uh, between K2 from photo hole and K2 from uh, the transient measurement? So we scratched our head uh, sometime and we realized that in order to access bimolecular recombination where the slope is half, you actually need quite intense sunlight. So PB operates under one sun condition and if you want to see the bimolecular recombination, you actually have to go to a few hundred suns. And which is possible with the PL because the initial PL, TL PL, the initial PL intensity can be quite high. But our uh, steady state photo measurement, we are uh, not going to access this bimolecular regime. So our measurement uh, was done always on the monomolecular regime. Then your next question is, how can you see the slope of half if your, uh, if your measurement is always on the monomolecular uh, recombination? The answer is actually, it's in the in textbook. Uh, so this is the textbook written in the 60s. And if you have some uh, concentration of traps in, in the gap, you can actually have what appears to be bimolecular recombination even in the reason where monomolecular recombination dominates. So the details you can uh, 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 refer to the, this textbook and uh, for the interest of time, I'll just move on. So this was published last year uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Nature. So you, uh, for more details, uh, you can read uh, this paper here. 
So let me switch to the, um, the uh, uh, another topic here, um, which is the uh, perovskite silicon tandem. So like I told you, the smartest strategy to, uh, uh, when you consider commercial, commercialization of this technology is utilizing the already uh, market dominating silicon technology. So tandem. So the single junction solar cell has a theoretical limit of uh, maximum efficiency of, of about 34% as dictated by a Shockley quasar limit. But if you stack two light observers with a different band gaps, you can actually improve uh, efficiency a lot because you will utilize the wider range of sunlight by using two materials with the different band gaps. And, but you cannot just put any two materials with the different band gaps. So there is an ideal combination. So the most ideal combination is about 1.7 EB top cell and about 1.1 EB bottom cell. And that theoretically, with this combination, you can get the uh, efficiency as high as 47%, a 46 or 47%. And very luckily, the top cell, the 1.1 EB, the most successful PB material, silicon and CIGS, they have band gap exactly 1.12, exactly what we need. So if you can improve the currently uh, the, the, the high efficiency single junction perovskite solar cell, the band gap is about 1.1, uh, 1.55 or 1.6. So if we can only improve the band gap of perovskite by 0.1 EV, without degrading its performance, we are gonna hit the jackpot, okay? And the tuning the band gap of proboscite is fairly easy. By replacing halite, the iodide, with the bromide and with the chloride, you can actually cover entire range of visible light. So the band gap tuning is very easy, except the one problem is when you mix the halite on the dark, it forms uniform alloy, but under illumination, they tend to phase segregate the uh, segregation of halide into iodide rich, which is low band gap, uh, and the into bromide rich, which is high band gap. So this is uh, uh, the huge stability issue. So if you look at literature, uh, I mean, the silicon perovskite tender work uh, go, uh, goes back as early as 2015, but uh, if you look at the earlier works, the band gap of perovskite, they just used the band gap of conventional perovskite, even though they knew this is not the ideal combination because of the stability issue. Then how do you solve the stability issue? It's rather simple uh, by uh, uh, applying uh, appropriate uh, the passivation layer, what's called uh, 2D passivation layer. So what is 2D perovskite? So perovskite has a crystal structure of ABX3, the 3D structure here, shown here. And if you incorporate excess number of A molecules or excess number of long chain molecule, which is labeled here A prime, these A prime molecules, they serve as separator. So this collection of uh, the octahedron layers are separated by these large a prime long chain molecules. And if you put a lot of them, the each single, um, the perovskite layer, uh, octahedron layers will be separated and the stoichiometry will be two, one, four phase. So by adding in your pre, uh, perovskite precursor solutions, A prime chemicals, and by controlling the ratio of A prime and 3D perovskite uh, precursors, you can actually form this 2D structure within 3D structure of your perovskite and these 2D structure, they tend to form at grain boundaries and they passivate the defects and therefore they improve stability as well as performance. So the most common um, uh, 2D additive, 2D perovskite forming additive is PEAI. So people have used this a lot. So in our uh, uh, beginning of our work uh, for this composition, which yield 1.7 EB perovskite, we've also added the PEAI. But the one problem with the, this 2D additive is that uh, if you put two excessive PAI, so this is the mole percentage of PAI 2D additive in your precursor solution, then you see that the fill factor and current degrades, even though VOC improves. 
So like I told you earlier, the, if you want to improve VOC, the passivation is must. And by adding a lot of these 2D additive, you continuously improve VOC. But with the PAI, the problem is your fill factor and your current degrees. The reason is these 2, 2D layers, they tend to be insulating. So by uh, incorporating large amount of 2D additives, uh, you're going to form uh, quite a bit of area with the high uh, ele ele uh, electrical resistance. And people have focused on the cation part of this 2D additive PA, so they replaced with the other long chain molecules. But what people have overlooked is the anion part of these 2D additives. So we realized that the anion part is something that we can explore. And so we replaced iodine with the SCN molecule here, so PASCN as 2D additive. And we found that even if you put three uh, mole percent, there is literally no degradation in field factor and the current. So motivated by this, the, uh, uh, the initial uh, result, so we further optimized. So now we mixed iodide and SCN, and we scanned the whole range of uh, uh, I to SCN. So for, and then we realized that the, after the optimization, we found that 25% iodide and 75% SCN, we get the maximum efficiency because this is the compromise between uh, VOC and JSC and field factor. And we achieved the 20.7% wide band gap perovskite, which was the record e uh, efficiency uh, among the values uh, reported for wide band gap. And also this material has fairly good um, stability. So this is the measurement on the continuous illumination. So after a thousand hours of illumination, the, our best record champion cell, it retained over 80% of its uh, initial efficiency. Then the next step is now we have a highly efficient and highly stable uh, wide band gap perovskite. Then the reasonable next step is applying into the silicon. So we applied this material onto the silicon cell and we achieved 20.6%, uh, which was the record when this was uh, uh, for, uh, when we got the, uh, the, <laughs> the efficiency first time. But now there are high, high efficiency in the literature too. But anyway, this is a fairly good number. And one thing I want to um, uh, emphasize here is that our bottom cell, the bottom silicon, the silicon, uh, the efficiency of our bottom cell is only 17.5%. Uh, I mean, you can easily find silicon cells over 20 to 23%. But even with this mediocre performing silicon bottom cell, with our um, top perovskite, we achieved 26.7%. So in the future, if you improve the efficiency of bottom cell, uh, achieving 30%, which uh, people in the field of PV consider as dream, wouldn't be no longer a dream. And this result was published uh, earlier this year in, uh, in science. And another thing that we found uh, here in this study is um, the chemical nature of this 2D uh, phase. So this is TM result uh, done by uh, Dr. Hee Jung, who is a longtime friend of mine, uh, uh, who is at uh, Northwestern right now, who is, by the way, the excellent uh, microscopist. So he did um, the careful measurement of our uh, champion cell, and he identified that 2D layers indeed in between, stuck between grains. And by careful uh, atomic resolution analysis, he found that these 2D layers is basically PBI2. I mean, before our work was published, people had naively assumed the 2D layer that they have in their sample, 2D passivation layer, was this. 214 phase, but our work found that it is not 201 phase, it is actually PBI2 with uh, some uh, dopant incorporated, such as cesium or uh, other molecules stuck. And another interesting thing that we found here is that uh, there is a structural defect in 2D passivation layers formed with the SCN. So if you look at here, there is a layers of PBI2, and in between, there is extra half plane, which is like edge dislocation in your metallic sample. And also, there is a, some defect where two layers are touching each other. So we believe that uh, this structural defect is actually beneficial, working as 
retarded transport path across layers. And that's why our 2D, it is not as electrically insulating as uh, iodine-based 2D layers, and therefore we will improve field factor and current with our uh, anion engineered 2D layers. And in passing, I want to also mention a couple of other works that was published in Science uh, within, uh, ten, uh, within one month uh, uh, before uh, our work was published. So this work is from the Sargent Group at Toronto, close to 26%. And this is the McGee's work, uh, close to 27%. So including our works, I found this very interesting. Three papers were uh, published in Science in, in, a, in a time span of one month. So this is all I have, uh, and uh, I should thank um, the hard work of my student. So this photo was taken almost uh, one and a half years ago before Corona, um, reminiscing uh, good about good old days when we could gather in a confined place without, uh, without um, wearing mask. So some student graduated and some student joined here, uh, and I want to single out two students, the Song Yeol, who did uh, the photo all work for Nature, and the second work, the, the Promscat tandem, uh, this work was mostly done by uh, the excellent graduate student uh, there. And so I feel really fortunate to work with the, this uh, group of excellent uh, students. And I would like also thank uh, my collaborators and uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk. So. Here, uh, please let me uh, lead a question for you. So thank you, Professor. Because I'm new to the field, I have a basic question. So what is the explicit role of halides in the tuning the perovskite band gap? Uh, very good question. Uh, oh, so how, how, how do you tune uh, the band gap of perovskite by uh, exchanging halide? So basically, by changing the iodide to bromide, the lattice constant contract and by uh, contracting lattice constant, it will naturally lead to uh, opening the gap. And by further replacing with the chloride, the lattice will contract even further, and therefore the gap will be uh, widened even further. So the band gap increases. So, uh, so I have one question. So you are experts in this field. So do you expect that what will be the maximum efficiency you can get using this perovskite approach. Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, for single cell, um, the Shockley quasar limit with this band gap, I think it's about. Uh, let me go to the NL chart here. NL chart here. NL chart here. Um, so with the uh, uh, um, uh, the single junction with the uh, band gap of about 1.6, you can theoretically get to about 30 to 33 percent. But that means, the SQ limit means, there shouldn't be no non-radiate recombination, which means your PLQI, uh, photoluminescence quantum yield, has to be 100 percent, which is nearly impossible. So practically, people say 27 to 28 is the practical maximum limit that you can get. But I hear that uh, there is an unofficial record uh, where people have seen perovskite over 26%. So close to 27, possible. With a tandem, of course, the higher will be possible. Yes, there's one more question. So you mentioned that you need to improve the efficiency of the bottom cell, which is silicon. So what strategies, strategies can you use, for example? Oh, excellent question. Um, so um, there is some part that I skip here, but um, the high efficiency silicon cell, uh, if you think of uh, 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 the optical property of silicon, using silicon for PV is stupid because silicon is not meant to absorb light because it has indirect band gap. So therefore, to improve the light absorption, people use very thick silicon and also they texture the front surface. So your silicon cell, the front top surface of your silicon is not flat, is textured so that they improve light trapping. But 
uh, coating perovskite on top of textured silicon surface is very challenging. So therefore, if you look at our uh, sample, we used, even though we know, knew we're gonna lose some performance, we used flat silicon because there's, uh, we couldn't coat perovskite on the textured surface. And this texture is the bottom surface, not the surface where we coat the perovskite. So by uh, using texture silicon, that will immediately improve efficiency a couple of percent. And as a matter of fact, the sergeant group, in collaboration with the KAUST, they use the texture silicon, and then they coat fairly thick perovskite, which is not recommended using thick, unnecessarily thick uh, observer is not recommended. However, they used it. So actually in my group, we are now switched to working on the perovskite and CIGS solar cell because CIGS has similar efficiency with the silicon and we don't need texturing for bottom cell, so which will make uh, life much easier. So Probskai CIGS is uh, a new area that we are working on, and I hope uh, I can report good results uh, in the near future.